name is Meredith Taylor, and I'm the Community Relations Manager for City Current. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, this tour is going to be fantastic. We actually had it planned in person for this exact day. Um, and under the current circumstances, we feel so fortunate to be able to bring you the National Ornamental Metal Museum right to your homes. Um, I wanna introduce Andrew Bartolotta, our Director of Digital Media, who's here with us today. He will be taking questions throughout the tour. So please be sure to put those in the chat box. Um, we'll be answering those towards the end. Um, and also, I want to introduce Nancy Cook, our Woman of the Hour. She is the Exhibitions Manager uh, for the only National Ornamental Museum of its kind right here in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so thank you, Nancy, for being here. We're so excited for you to lead us on today's tour. And without further ado, I'll let you take it away. Great. So as I said to Meredith, if, if at any point you all can't hear me or can't see me, just let me know. Um, but I'll tell you, I'm excited to have everybody today. This has been a, an odd time for all of us, I think. And one of my favorite parts of my job is giving tours. So I'm very excited to share this with you today. Um, as Meredith said, my name is Nancy Cook. I am the exhibitions manager at the Metal Museum. Uh, that means that I am in charge of pretty much everything related to our temporary or rotating exhibitions. Um, and I have been with the museum for close to five years, be five years in July. And I thought I'd start out here um, at the front of our museum uh, so that I can give you guys a similar to experience to what you would have when you were here visiting with us. So I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about the history of this site itself, um, the history of the museum. And then we were going to go through the temporary exhibitions. We're gonna see a little bit of our permanent collection in the library. And then I'm also going to show our blacksmith shop and foundry. Uh, along the way, I'll point, on, point out different points of interest, different uh, sculptures we have on the grounds, and then we will end with our beautiful river view. And I'm happy to take any questions at the end. So um, we will get started. And I want to, I'm gonna turn the camera around because the first thing I wanna point out are these two mounds. Can everybody see that okay? These um, are in a city park just across from us at the museum. But it's important to point this out because this is part of the full site itself. So these are Native American ceremonial mounts. They were built by the Chickasaw Nation, we think probably uh, as long ago as the 1500s. There were originally seven of these mounts. Um, only two exist now. And I'm gonna walk a little bit further over here because I want you to see there are uh, a bricked in sort of tunnel entrance, I don't know if you can see that, on this northern side of this first mound up here. That is the only remnant of Fort Pickering. So there were numerous forts in this area starting around the time of the revolution, owned by the French. Uh, and then finally, the Americans built one here uh, on this site, it's called Fort Pickering. And it was named after uh, the Postmaster General, George Washington's Postmaster General, Timothy Pickering. And it stretched, it's, it's kind of incredible, it stretched from this area over here all the way down to Beale Street. So we're talking an enormous amount of buildings housing huge numbers of troops, um, a really incredible site. So that bricked in tunnel entrance is a remnant from the time the fort was here. They hollowed out that mound and used it to store arms and ammunition. Um, and then once the fort was dismantled, it was dismantled in 1862 during the Civil War, they bricked that in collapsed it so you can't get in there anymore. But I will tell you, if you all are craving a good river view sunset, our grounds are not open to the public yet. On the other side, there is a trail where you can actually walk up to the top and you can get a really beautiful view of the river and the sunset from there. So highly recommend if you all are itching to get outside and get a good river view sunset. So, uh, after Fort Pickering was dismantled and after the Civil War, I'm going to turn you around so you can see this is the hospital campus. 
and that includes both our side over here, this western side, and then the big hospital building and everything over on this side, which is owned by a private developer. Um, the hospital was built around um, the 1870s, and it was a yellow fever research hospital. It took care of, you know, sick and injured sailors on the Mississippi. It was also there to serve the public. So it was a very busy hospital. And originally it contained five buildings. Um, only one of those currently is still standing that was built in the 1800s. You will see it, it's our library building. Um, the rest of the buildings you'll see are brick. They were all rebuilt as part of the WPA in the 1930s. So this western half of the campus, which is our grounds, uh, is owned by the city of Memphis. The eastern half owned by a private developer. And I was telling Meredith just before we started, they are turning that main hospital building into condos right now. Um, it's on the historic register, so the facade has stayed the same, but they have really done a lot of good work to it and it's gonna be beautiful. Um, and then our buildings, again, were part of that campus. So when we moved into the property, everything had to be built from scratch. Everything had to be rebuilt into gallery space. Um, our museum used to be nurses dormitories. The library and permanent collection building used to be administration. Um, and then our artist residence, as you can see back there, that used to be the junior officer's quarters. And then the only building that we built are the Smithy and Foundry buildings. And those are in the back. We built those in the 80s. And those sort of were built to match the rest of the architecture. But the very first thing I want to show you is the very first thing you'll see when you come to the museum. I'm going to back up here and hope I don't get run over. These are our 10th anniversary gates. One of my favorite things about the Metal Museum is that we have incorporated so much of our collection, so much artist work into the buildings themselves, into the grounds. Um, you'll see it if you ever get to visit every handrail, every uh, drawer pull, every light switch plate. We made it here um, and it was all handmade by different artists. So these 10th anniversary gates, I think they're a really appropriate thing for you to first see when you walk in. These were designed by a British blacksmith named Richard Quinnell. And these were first built and put together and released on Mother's Day, 1989. We opened our grounds in 79. So that is the basis for calling them our 10th anniversary gates. And wow, these are, I, I, I love telling people about these because I think they, they sort of assume that one artist did all of this. There are over 200 artists who participated in the making of these gates. And as I get a little bit closer, I'll show you the different rosettes on this gate. They are all unique, all handmade. And there are now over 360 of them. Um, again, I said this was first built in 1989. In 2014, we did a complete renovation on these gates. We took all the rosettes off. We had them photographed. We put together a catalog, which you can purchase online. And then everything was cleaned up and put back on the gates. It was a huge project. Um, so they come in pairs and the full design of the gate is made up of these S-scroll structures. So that's an S-scroll. And the rosettes, I said, come in pairs. So there's a top and a bottom. And the artist would have made both the top and bottom piece. Um, just a few of my favorites, let's see. Down here, I think, is there's a kinetic one. Here we go. It's got a propeller that spins. Um, most of the rosettes are flower themed because of course a rosette usually is a flower. Um, up here we have this beautiful brooch-like one. Uh, that pair right there is made from enamel, so it has glass baked onto the surface to give it that beautiful color. Let's see, where is the teacup? There it is. This is my favorite one. This teacup here, can everybody see that? 
there's lots of references to England in this because of course the designer was was English. And then let me see. Oh yeah, this is always the kid's favorite. Here we have um, traditional English breakfast. So it's like sausage and bangers and mash and eggs. And then here is um, traditional American lunch, burger and fries. So that's that two pair. And there's one more over here. Yeah, these are um, the two globes we have. And I love this because there's a dot on this one in Surrey, England, where the designer is from. And this one, of course, has a dot uh, right there at Memphis. So that's our little connection there. So really quickly, um, all of these folks who participated in this had a hand in making this museum what it is today. This museum would not be here without the help of all of the artists who have participated. And we were started by an artist organization. And I'm gonna warn you, it's a little bit of a mouthful. It's the National Ornamental and Miscellaneous Metals Association, <laughs> or NOMA. Um, and they were a group of blacksmiths and metal artists back in the 70s. They had a conference in Alabama in 75 where they decided they wanted to put together a museum. And they went on a national scouting search for a place that would fit um, the mission of the museum and, and fit the culture and Memphis won. So what, what had happened essentially was the hospital property was divided. A private developer purchased the eastern half. This half was still owned by the city of Memphis. And as we are a 501c3 tax exempt organization, we fit the requirements for this site. And luckily we get to lease it from the city of Memphis for a dollar a year. All right, folks, we're gonna head inside. And as we come in, this is the gorgeous view you get as you come inside our grounds. And the first sculpture I'm going to point out is this beautiful piece by Brent Cainton. This is a kinetic sculpture, meaning it moves in the wind. It's really just this one part up here that's the actual sculpture. It sits on one pin and in the wind it will turn and move. Um, the reason we have placed this sculpture first, when you first walk into the museum, is Brent Kington is probably the most important American blacksmith of, of the 20th century. Brent Kington started the only metals master's program at SIU Carbondale, Southern Illinois University Carbondale, and that program still exists today. So he essentially trained an entire generation of American blacksmiths in this art. Um, and he's known for a huge number of series of sculptures. He's known for this kinetic series, um, all these outdoor sculptures that move in the wind. We have, I think, about 12 objects of his in our collection. So this is just one. You'll see more on our tour. He's an incredible influence for most of the artists that we work with. Um, and especially our founder, James Wallace, who we call Wally. They were great friends, and um, Wally still is very involved in the museum today. He is a blacksmith artist, and he made this place into a home for the metals community around the globe. Um, because as Meredith mentioned, we are the only museum in the United States that focuses just on the art and craft of fine metal work. We can't find another. Um, so that's Brent Kington. Lovely man. He passed in 2013, sadly, um, but he has left his legacy for sure on this, in, on this institution. The second one I want to show you guys while we're still out here is this beautiful bench. It's definitely a more modern piece. Can everybody see that okay? This might be my favorite piece in the collection. Um, this was made by Vivian Beer and Vivian was a former Tributaries artist. Tributaries is a series of exhibitions that we have for usually younger artists, the artists sort of first beginning to make their name in the metalsmithing community. And you will see a Tributaries exhibit here shortly. So Vivian has been a longtime friend to the museum. And this series of benches 
is called Anchored Candy. There are, I don't think she has any of these left. They are almost all entirely in public collections. Um, I know MFA Boston also has one. Um, I believe SF MoMA might have one as well. So this one is called Cleo. And this entire series is based off of the idea of both fashion design and hot rods, according to Vivian. So the paint that you see is auto paint. That's how she gets that beautiful sparkle on there. So it's steel and auto paint. Um, and the bench is quite comfortable. And one of my favorite quotes from Vivian about this bench is that it is a bench that would work equally for Cleopatra and for Beyonce. So I love it. It's one of my favorite pieces. All right, we're gonna turn around this way. This is our gorgeous museum building. And as I said, this was the former nurses dormitories. So it had to be completely revamped to turn into office spaces, gallery spaces, all that good stuff. And we'll head inside. As we go through, you're going to see me unlocking doors and things like that because, of course, we're not fully open yet. Just bear with me. All right. So, I want to first show you because we have taken advantage of being closed and <laughs> of quarantine, and we have completely redone, repainted our store, um, which I think hasn't been done in probably over 10 years. So this is exciting stuff that that finally our store is, is much cleaner. Um, I just want to mention to everybody really quickly, everything in our store, and I do mean everything, is handmade by individual artists in America. Um, the only thing you can't really say that about is our museum line of t-shirts and mugs. But most of this stuff, including these catalogs, this is the gate catalog I was mentioning, um, most of that is going to be available online for purchase. So do check that out if you get a chance. Even some of our like high-end jewelry, you'll find it online for purchase. So as we walk through the lobby, we'll come first to our Keeler Gallery, which right now is hosting tributary Sophie Glenn. And I am so excited to show you this, this exhibit. Um, as I mentioned, no one has really seen these yet. Um, we opened these officially sort of mid-March, end of March. And of course we had to go into quarantine shortly afterwards. The exhibit upstairs, you all will be the first to see it. There are some people who have seen this exhibit, but not many. So Tributaries, as I said, is an exhibition series that we use to honor younger artists, artists who are beginning to make their name in the field. Um, and it's important for them to get their name out there this way. They get to put this on their resume. It's a good mark. And Sophie is now officially the only Tributaries artist we will host in 2020, so we're very grateful for her. And this exhibit is subtitled, Rust Never Sleeps. And Sophie is a furniture maker. She is very young, I think she's 27. She grew up in New York City and she went to San Diego State for her master's degree. And she received that in furniture, furniture design and woodworking. So you might be asking, why is she at the Metal Museum? <laughs> Well, she has come up with this beautiful series called Rest Never Sleeps, and I'm just going to read really quickly a part of her statement here. My practice is often a reflection of my frustrations with juggling my role as a furniture maker, woodworker, and metal worker. So there's this tension for her between wood and metal, despite the fact that both materials are used frequently in furniture design. And I will tell you from experience, Metal workers, and I'm sure woodworkers, have this sort of intense relationship with the material that they work with. And so for Sophie, I'm sure there was a huge sort of internal battle for her. Which material do I honor? You know, which material do I um, think is important and should emphasize? And the way that she dealt with that juggling act, with that tension, is by creating works that appear to be made of wood 
They're going to appear like wood antiques, but I assure you they're entirely fabricated in steel. So as we come in, we'll see this first chair here. Um, Sophie inject a lot of humor in her work. I think they're sort of inherently funny because of this Trump loyal effect, this illusion. Um, this piece is called Tommy Boy. And as you can see, they're based on pretty classic furniture designs. You know, this is something I'm sure people have seen um, in their grandparents' home, um, in an antique store. And I mean, even if I get close, I know it's, it's difficult to tell, but even this, this um, fabric part is steel. And she also adapts different woodworking techniques to steel. So if you've ever heard of kerf bending, which is basically where you cut tiny slits in a piece of wood to allow it to curve, she's using that same technique with steel to get these various curves. And then of course, welding the different parts together and we call that fabrication. So anytime you're putting together or building different parts, that's fabrication. So I love this piece, Tommy Boy. Um, over here, it is a pair of chairs, and these are a little smaller. They're almost like <laughs> chairs for little kids. I love them, they're so cute. Um, this one especially, I don't know why, but the white paint for me makes it look especially like antique wood. And again, even this part here, this is woven pieces of steel that she has painted. Um, I asked Sophie about, you know, why she used these bright colors and things. And, and I think it's just that furniture is oftentimes just such a very serious thing and people um, are, can be a little bit um, snooty about it. And I think she thought, you know, I'm young and I, I like bright colors and this is my furniture. And for me, there's still a great sense of elegance despite these bright colors. Um, this is the coat rack and mirror and she titled this one Dirty Birdie. <laughs> which I love. You can see me there in the mirror. Um, and of course, as you can see, these are utilitarian pieces. They're functional. Um, so we like that a lot in artists and makers. They value um, design, certainly. They value their craft, but they also often make work that is functional, that's usable. Um, moving on. This piece is called Lady Beefcake, and oftentimes her names um, relate to the furniture style itself. I think Beefcake is a, it's a type of style, but you can see really well on this one all that she does to um, distress the surface. That's the result of sanding, of allowing it to rust, allowing the natural effects to take over, and it ends up looking quite a bit like a wood antique. Um, this beautiful blue one here, I love this color. This piece is called Millennial in Law. And, oh, I just love it. It's, it, the drawer is functional, it moves easy. It's a beautiful piece. It's sort of mid-century modern in its style. Um, exceptionally well-crafted. And of course, you've got this great distressed top. And finally, We'll come to my favorite piece in the show. So I mean, this piece is just magnificent. This is called Gorgeous George, and it's a King George style chair. So very traditional style again. And as I get closer, you'll see all this great distressing she did. This just looks beautiful to me right here. Um, these are um, bronze. The seats themselves are sort of bronze that she has stamped out. So still metal. And then to inject a little bit of that humor, I'll <laughs> see if you can see it. Um, can everybody see who that is right there? <laughs> that is George Costanza from Seinfeld. So this is an image transfer. Um, and traditionally in these chairs, you would have a portrait of a family member, of you know, someone in, in the aristocracy or someone important. Um, and she has used the King George, as we refer to George Costanza. Um, 
And of course, the stress is if it looks antique and it looks old, which I find hilarious. So that's gorgeous George. So please do look her up. Um, she has pieces available for purchase. Um, you can go to sophieglenn.com. I'll show you her name. It's Glenn with two N's. And you can also visit our website to learn more about her in the exhibit. She's great. And I am very, very thankful that she has allowed us to extend this exhibition. So it will be up through September 27th. And if you do get the chance to come see it in person, please do. Um, you'll be amazed that even if you get up close, they still very much look wood antiques. All right, everybody. We're gonna head up to the main event. Um, our Gasparini galleries are the upstairs part of the museum building. Excuse the stairway, I can point up so you can see our beautiful tin ceiling up there. And as we come up, you'll see our tidal wall. So this exhibition is titled Tradition of Excellence. It is Japanese techniques in contemporary metal arts. Um, this was not an exhibit that we put together. It was curated by a, a lady named Hiroko Yamada. She is a metalsmith herself, and um, she uh, is the director of High Art Gallery, which I believe is in Madison, Wisconsin. She is just incredible. And she put together this exhibit, and I'll tell you, um, the first time I saw it was in Chicago. The whole, well, not the whole, the whole museum, but a large, portion of our staff went to Chicago last year for the uh, SNAG conference. That's the Society of North American Goldsmiths. Um, our original founder, James Wallace, was being honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award, which is fantastic. So a bunch of us went. Um, and my director texted me and she said, you've got to go to the Japanese consulate. They have this incredible exhibit on. So we went down there and we're just blown away by this level of work. Um, and of course I was there with a bunch of metalsmiths who have studied metalsmithing their whole life. And they were looking at this stuff and going, how did they do that? So um, I thought, well, it's a shame that it's only gonna be up for a month. Let's bring it to Memphis. So that's what we did. Um, and they, like I'm saying, you guys are the first ones who get to see it. So I'm just gonna read a little bit of our intro here because I think it's important. So curated by metalsmith Hiroko Yamada, this exhibition brings together 26 artists, six American and 20 Japanese, three of whom have received the highest honor to be designated as Japanese living national treasures. And I will talk about what that is. Um, the artist's work represents a broad view based in historical techniques and approach they range from strictly adhering to tradition to reinventing or reinterpreting tradition through a contemporary practice. And throughout, we have labeled everything with the proper Japanese terms for the techniques, for the materials, um, even though folks might be unfamiliar with them because it's an important part of honoring the skill that's required here. Um, and there is incredible skill on display in this exhibition. So we'll head right in. And here we are in the first part of our Gasparini galleries. I'm so excited to show you this. So the first thing I want to point out, we have these great photos on the wall. And um, this exhibit was sort of originated at Penland. If you don't know what Penland is, Penland School of Craft is in North Carolina. It's a wonderful craft school, way up in the mountains. It's beautiful. Um, and so this was a little bit of a collaborative effort. A lot of the Americans in this show are Penland artists, Penland aff affiliated artists. And one of those artists traveled to Japan and was able to photograph a lot of our Japanese artists in their own studios, which I love. So this is Uino Toshio. This wonderful picture of him in his studio holding up his 
teapot he just raised. And then the rest of the photographs all come from the same studio. This is the uh, Nishikata family studio in Segato, Japan. You see it's beautiful. But what these pictures sort of point to is how Japanese metalwork techniques are passed down. And the way that normally happens is between families, from father to son, and so on and so on. Um, and families like the Nishikata family will, you know, train everybody involved, everybody living there. <laughs> Wives, girlfriends, sisters, everybody takes part um, and learns these skills. And the idea of apprentice master is much more formalized in Japan than it is in America, certainly. So they still have this very strict apprentice master system when it comes to learning these skills. So we'll start with some of the artwork. Um, some of the pieces I'll just kind of you know, give you basic info, but I've got more detailed information about some of the others. Uh, this is a beautiful and frankly mind-blowing raised vessel by Mizuko Yamada. Raising simply means that you're starting with a flat sheet of metal. And then you shape that flat sheet around some sort of curved shape or pointed shape. And you literally raise it up into the form you want. So you hammer around in concentric circles called cycles until you've got this vessel shape. And it's kind of an amazing process to watch. It's this repeated process of hammering, heating it up, which is called annealing. You just sort of heat it with a torch to make it softer, and then you raise it up. Usually folks do this with softer metals. Um, silver and copper are probably the most popular. Um, over here, these two gorgeous Mokumegane vessels. Um, the first thing I want to point out, this one here, this is by Norio Tamagawa, and he is the first of the Japanese living national treasures in this exhibition. So Japan has done something remarkable. Um, and of course, in the United States, we have cultural protection laws, and they, they vary from state to state. Um, there are certain objects that we have deemed worthy of preservation because they tell the American story. You can find those in the Smithsonian. Um, of course, there are cultural sites that are designated all the time um, for protection. So Japan took that a step further. And in 1950, they passed a law called the Law of Cultural Protection Act. And what that did was establish a system of Japanese living national treasures as a means to pass on traditional Japanese artistic skills. So it's very, very competitive. There's a limited number of people that they will designate. They're all for specific skills. And it fosters this huge competition between Japanese artists because once you are named a Japanese living national treasure, the price of your work goes way up, um, your recognition goes way up, and it's, it's a very coveted status in society. But the whole purpose of it is so that these traditional historic techniques that either originated or were perfected in Japan are passed down to future generations. So again, as I said, this apprentice master relationship is very strong and it's important, in fact, required of these living national treasures that they pass on their knowledge to other people. And in a sense, that's what this exhibit is all about. Because, of course, these techniques are passed on to other Japanese artists. Hiroko's goal in curating this exhibition was these techniques should be for the world to learn and to understand. And that's why we have this participation of American artists who are learning these techniques. So, both these vessels use probably what's the most common and most heard of Japanese metalworking technique, mokumegane. Um, let's see, can I show you how that's spelled here? Can you all see that? Mokumegane. Um, it basically translates to wood grain metal. 
And lots of American artists do this. This has been, again, probably the most common one you'll see in America that comes from Japan. And as you can see, I mean, it, it looks like wood grain a little bit. And the way this is done is by layering several sheets of metal. You're forge welding them together through heat and compression. And you end up with a stacked billet of alternating metals. So imagine that stacked billet. And then you slice off a side of it. And then you face that side face up what you're gonna have are these different layers. And then once you hammer that out or raise it up in this case, you get these beautiful swirls and things that make it look like wood grain. So I hope that made sense. <laughs> there are lots of videos of Mocha Megane online if you need a clearer sense of how that works. But it's essentially a layering of metals and then you hammer that out to create this wood grain texture. Um, I should also mention, this is Norio's son. So this is father and son together in this case. Moving on this way, this is the work of Seisei Asai. We've got some little um, vessels. These are incense containers. Um, this is a water dropper here. This is another, I think both of these, yeah, both of these are incense burners. And here we can see a few different techniques. So, um, Kasane Gane, which is very similar to Mokume Gane. Again, you're layering different metals, but in this case, it's not necessarily looking like wood grain. So you're still layering all those metals together. I think you can see that there. And it creates this beautiful texture, but not quite looking like a wood grain. So that's Kasane Gane. And it's used on all of these pieces. Um, the other one I want to point out is Hagiwai Zogan, which I know is a mouthful. But that just means marriage of metals. So you're putting together metals in different patterns. And then they have used uh, patina to get that black color. This is, by the way, a traditional Japanese patina called Rokusho patina. Um, Let's see. Oh yeah, Genkashi and Kenkashi. <laughs> Both are forms of fire gilding. One is for silver, one is for gold. And essentially all you're doing is applying a mercury um, amalgam to a precious metal. You heat it up, you allow it to volatize, and then it changes the surface color. So this, and depending on the base metal, depending on the heat, it will turn different colors. Sometimes it turns bright gold. In this instance, it has turned black. There's just a way of adding color to metal. These here, some of my favorite pieces of the show. Um, this is an artist named Kyoko Fuji. And of course, you're seeing more raised vessels or tanken. Tanken is the Japanese term for hammering vessels. Um, this is a confectionery dish and this is a tea caddy. And this artist has used a technique known as Nunome Zogen. So, <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see that very well. This is basically a gold leaf or really any kind of leaf inlay technique. What the artist will do is trace out a design on the surface, um, and then they will chisel where they want to put the, the gold leaf or silver leaf, and they chisel in several different directions. So they might go this way, and then back this way, and then down, because what you wanna do is create a cross-hatching effect. And I'm sure you guys have seen cross-hatching when you're you know, sketching or something like that. So they usually, they literally take a chisel and cross hatch in the surface. And then that, that leaf, that silver or gold leaf, is sort of pushed into that grid that's created with a wooden dowel usually. Um, and that holds it in place without any adhesive. So you grind it in. I'm gonna set up my, my extra battery here. Um, you grind it into those little grid-like patterns and it stays, and then all you have to do is polish it. So this is a very popular Japanese way of 
creating um, surface decoration, and that's beautiful. Um, Ninome Zogen roughly translates as um, uh, fabric inlay. So it, it looks a little bit like fabric once you're done, like a textile. Let's see here. Moving on. Nancy, we lost you. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> All right, sorry about that, folks. All right, so I want to point out this case here. So this is a, there are five vessels in this case, plus two brooches. And uh, the artist is Hiroko Sato Pijanowski. She is from Japan, but is, is an expat now. So she lives in America. She married an American. Um, and she has collaborated with an American artist named James Bisti for several of these pieces. I love these examples of Mocha Megane because they have really taken a lot of the shine away. So it really looks like wood. Um, let me get a good look at all of these here. Just all various Mocha Megane vessels. This one is incredible. I mean, the, the amount of work it would take to raise that and then to um, you know, treat the surface so that it doesn't shine is just incredible. And then as you can see, sometimes we get different colors. This beautiful black and silver one here. And then, let's talk about these two little beautiful bridges. So they come in these custom boxes with these silk linings. They're so beautiful. And you can't see it, but there is Japanese writing and ink on the back of the boxes with the title of the piece and everything. Um, this is a orchid brooch on a piece of jade. That's the, the green that you see. Let me see, can you get a better view this way? Um, the flower itself was constructed with what was what's called uchidashi. So we know that in English as chasing and repousse, which is actually a French term, but that's um, what most Americans or Europeans would call it. Essentially, all you're doing is taking a flat sheet of metal and you create the basic form by hammering in from the back and then you flip it over and you chase in the details with a smaller chisel from the front. And that's how you get that beautiful kind of detail in the flower. So yeah, uchidashi. And that was done on this one as well. Move this way, because I want to show you some Americans. So these are some of the American artists who have been working in these techniques. Um, just incredible work. Uh, this is another Mokumegane vessel um, by Marvin Jensen. And then this strange amalgam, and the piece is called amalgam, um, has this you know, mokumegane detail at the back here. And moving this way, these are two of my favorite guys. All right. Andrew Mears and Seth Gould are both Penland affiliated artists. Um, I think. No, yes, Seth, Seth was a tributaries artist. He was one of our first tributaries artists. This is Seth Gould's work here. And then this is Andrew Mears. Andrew is going to be our first tributaries artist of 2021. So look forward to him. Um, and Andrew is actually a knife maker and he's incredible at it. Um, he's very young, but very talented. And this piece here is, it's an incense box. Um, and it uses an inlay technique. Inlay in, J in, J in Japanese is zogen. Um, so this uses a zogen inlay. As you can see, it's this beautiful little owl and moon. And it also uses another Japanese technique called wabori. And that just means that you're carving something from metal, using punches and chisels to actually carve it out. So that little owl detail in the moon would have been carved and then inlaid in the surface. And then this one, this beautiful little container by Seth Gold. See, it's got a gold top. 
And he has used that Nunome Zogen fabric inlay technique to inlay foil, silver foil on the surface to create that pattern. Over here, I just have to show you this, guys. This is another, yet another Mokumegane piece, but man, is it gorgeous. This is by Raihei Sako, um, and it's just a Mokumegane bowl. But I'm just sort of fascinated by that one. You could look at it forever, really. These beauties over here, um, Hiroki Iwata, has got to be one of my favorite artists in this exhibition. Um, this series is called Blue and Dewdrop. It was created in 2014. And these are really unique in the show because they are the only ones that actually contain enamel. And, you know, in my experience, lots of European, lots of American blacksmiths are very familiar with enamel and they use it frequently. But in Japan, my impression is that it's much less common. So this is a technique that they call shipo. Um, we would refer to it by its French term, which is cloisonne enamel. So enamel is very simple and it's an ancient, ancient technique. It is ground glass that you apply to the surface of metal. You place it in a kiln and it's got different minerals to create different colors. And then once you take it out of the kiln and allow it to cool, it forms this very sturdy, hard, glossy, glassy finish um, in various colors. And cloisonne means partitioned. So that just means that we're separating out the colors using various foils. He's got some wire. Um, Generally, what you would see in American or European enameling is you would see very distinct wire patterns. Um, here, it's less so. You know, the colors are still partitioned, but he's done it with foils. It's just a beautiful piece. Um, this one as well, I love. They're obviously unusual shapes, and they're very, if you can see on the side, they're very thin. Um, just gorgeous surfaces. So enameling is um, is an ancient technique used throughout the world and uh, creates durability. And yes, I think I saw somebody ask the question, are these functional? Absolutely. Yes. The only thing you can really do to enamel is drop it and break it. It's almost scratch resistant. All right. We're gonna move on to a couple other of our um, Japanese living national treasures. I am just fascinated with this work. This is Morihito Katsura. And as you can see in this case, we have two pieces by him, this beautiful vase that was created in 1990, and then an ornament. This is not a brooch. This is sewn in. This is sewn into its box. So this is a whole ornamental piece, including the box. Um, and it's a traditional Japanese flower. The Japanese name for it is Tatsutsugawa. I'm not sure what that is, but Tatsutsugawa. So these use a lot of our um, techniques, which I've, discussed, which I've discussed already. Uchidashi, the, the chasing and repuse to make the flower. Um, the Roku show patina for sure, which gives the little bit of color. And then I'm gonna go around this side. This is probably the best piece to see this Ginkeshi. Um, and that's the, the mercury amalgam I mentioned to create different colors. Because what it's done here is almost create like a, a shadow effect. So it, it's a roll of the dice, but I think most of the pieces in here use that mercury amalgam, that, that Ginkeshi or Kinkeshi fire gilding. And then this piece also uses Hagiawai's Zogen, which is that marriage of metals, layering different metals to create a surface pattern. Incredible artist. The next one, you can't miss out on Yuki. Um, Yuki Osumi, I um, just wrote a blog about this artist on our website. So if you all get a chance to see it, please go read it. I've also included a video of her um, 
raising a vessel of her doing her process, which includes Nunome Zogan. It's incredible. She's incredible. Um, Yuki Yusumi was the first female metal worker to receive the designation of Japanese living national treasure. And she received that designation in 2015. And she received it for Tenken, which is the hammering of vessels, the raising of vessels. As you can see in this one, we've got a little, little tea caddy or water vessel. And it's quite simple, except she has actually, um, you know, cast a little snail here at the top. Can you see that? And that becomes the handle on the lid. It's very cute. So again, we have this inlay foil technique where she would have used the cross hatching. I don't know if you can tell from here, but normally an artist will raise a vessel in horizontal cycles. This is not what Yuki did. She raised this in diagonal cycles. So you can see the lines actually curve this way, which is unbelievably difficult to do. But I love that piece. This is the piece that we featured on the postcard. And finally, Yoshio Uino. He is the artist we saw the picture of at the beginning, hold up, holding up his beautiful tea kettle. This is a gorgeous Mokume Gane kettle. Around this side, so you can see. This is probably the best example of Mokume Gane in the exhibit. Beautiful wood grain metal. And um, all of it has been raised. You've got this gorgeous spout here. That is definitely that Roku Shopatina on that end of the spout, which creates that bright gold color. All right. We're going to move into the second part here. This is Gasparini Gallery West, and the exhibit continues in here. And I just have to show you, this is probably my favorite picture that we have because it shows um, this is your basic family life. This is one of the younger sons, Ryota, with his wife, Masato, and they are doing patinas. So they are dipping the metal in different chemicals. They have them in these little kitty pools here, and that's how they get this great color. And I'm gonna show you what this Rokusho patina does when applied to tin. Look at this. So that patina creates different colors for different metals. Apparently when it's applied to tin and copper, you get this gorgeous blue purple. So again, these are tank and raised vessels with Rokusho patina. And they are just gorgeous. The kettle here is a double layered kettle. So, We've got that marriage of metals and we've got the stacking of silver and gold to create the kettle and there's little pieces of silver throughout just to create that surface design all right moving on again some of my favorites this is Motoko Oshiyama um, and these actually don't use any traditional Japanese techniques, these are, these are you know, fairly common techniques. This is just fusing. So she is using compression and heat to fuse different metals onto the surface. This one creates a sort of flower spring pattern. Um, this one is a bit more abstract. Both are vases, beautiful flower vases. Um, and one thing I'll point out throughout the exhibit, um, there are various you know, specific Japanese alloys. So shikudo is one of them. Um, Shibuichi is another common one. Um, both contain copper, but they're just uh, alloys more common and more specific to Japan. We don't really see them in America or in Europe. Uh, now these are the pieces that um, my buddy Kevin here on staff, who is our repair specialist, he must have stared at these for forever trying to figure out how it was done. <laughs> how it was done because they're, they're raised upwards. And yet, I mean, these lines remain completely straight. I can't tell you how difficult that would be to do. Um, this is again, that Kasane Gane, this layering of different metals. Um, 
and it has that kinkeshi, which here has turned it sort of brown, which is interesting. Um, this one is a little bit darker, again, with that kinkeshi, um, you know, fire gilding. And, and this one, the um, uh, Kasane Gane has actually curved around to the side. Again, immensely technically difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, even looking at them in person, I'm still not quite sure how they're done. <laughs> um, and then over here, we have a series of nine different ornaments. And again, these are you know, similar to the ones we saw over um, in the other gallery. Most of them are gonna use that Uchidashi um, sort of, uh, you know, chasing repuse. This one back here is a little octopus. I love that guy. And this one actually contains this gold piece here was carved. So that's the wabori. And finally, we have these great little pieces over here. Um, Kazuo Kashima created this little incense burner in this flower vase. It has this beautiful red interior. And again, these have, um, actually this one has what's called urushi applied to the surface. It's a tree sap common in Japan and it, it basically repels water. So it's a good thing to, to put on surface metal. <laughs> and finally, we have this beautiful flower brooch, um, again, created through that Uchidashi um, chasing repousse technique. And that is all for Tradition of Excellence. Um, I'm really excited that I got to show that with you all. I hope that the Japanese tournament weren't too you can go to the website and we have not only a 3D tour of this show, we have um, uh, uh, an activity that you can do at home with your kids and we have um, a glossary of the terms. We have, uh, I think the gallery guide is also up as well so you can learn a little bit about our curator, all kinds of good stuff. All right, we're gonna head out then. And I will just sort of briefly take you guys through our permanent collection in the library. And we'll see the smithy, the foundry, and then we'll take in a river view. All right. So coming back outside. All right. So you'll be you can see better on this side some of the construction that's happening with the hospital. Um, as we walk forward, this fish ahead of us was created as part of a workshop. We usually invite an international blacksmith every year to teach a workshop. And so we have all these giant sculptures that were created with 10, 15 folks. Um, and this wonderful fish is one of them. It's called Decompose on the Mississippi. And then this one here, this sculpture is by Tom Joyce. Um, Tom was our, I think, 96 master metalsmith. And they built this from scratch here on the grounds, these hammerheads were molded from Tom's favorite hammer. And the whole thing is meant to look like an atom. And I just think it's beautiful. So this is our gorgeous library building. Um, it was built in the 1800s, 1884 is the year. And we renovated it in 2007. That was the last project our, um, our former founder and director did before he retired was renovate this building. So very quickly, I just wanna show you guys some of the um, permanent collection exhibits you can see while you're at the museum. And again, the handrails you just saw, we definitely made. 
Right. So this is our library building. Um, and it does house a library upstairs. It's not a circulating library, it's a research library. But we also house parts of our permanent collection. And I think this has got to be one of everybody's favorite pieces. So <laughs> this is our giant Katie did, or grasshopper, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, I think 15 different artists worked on this. Um, we invited a Russian blacksmith named Anton Yukashev here to the museum, and he uh, led a workshop for our artists and others, and they created this beautiful piece of steel and copper. And it's enormous. I think it's close to five feet long. Um, the maquette or model for it we also have. So Anton made this first and then they would have modeled the larger piece after it. And then some of the other works we have in here are just, you know, important parts of the permanent collection. Um, important artists to highlight. This is one of my favorites, Stacey Lee Weber. Um, Stacy is a UW-Madison alum, and she is really making a name for herself, designing uh, jewelry for a lot of major fashion houses. And I think Gigi did recently wore some of her earrings on the red carpet, which is very thrilling. All right, I'll head upstairs. I should say this, this part down here is, is sort of under construction at the moment. It is an education space normally. So when we do activities for kids, we do it down here. All right, we're heading up our staircase here. And as we do, I'm gonna, Point the camera up so you can see our chandelier, which a lot of people actually miss coming up the stairs. Um, that's an historic piece and it's just beautiful, it weighs a lot. And then in this part of the museum, we have a very important part of our permanent collection, which is our gates and grills. So of course that's a big part of metal smithing. Um, blacksmithing, this is, this is their bread and butter. This is how a lot of blacksmiths make their money. Um, this is by Brian Russell, he's a British blacksmith. This door here is probably a museum favorite. Um, it was done by Alex Klom, who is a German blacksmith. A little bit closer. You can see all these incredible details. Isn't that gorgeous? I mean, it's just the amount of work that would have taken, I just can't even fathom. Um, more gates and grills. This is a garden gate. Um, let's see. Oh, another great door. This was from the, um, the Yellen workshop. So Samuel Yellen is probably, God, he's gotta be one of the most famous blacksmiths of the 20th century based in Philadelphia, and you'll see a lot of his public works in Philadelphia. And we have several of his pieces in the collection, but this was by, you know, again, several artists, I think 12 artists did this, um, in the Ellen workshop. And of course he's passed away, but his daughter still runs it. So I don't know if you can tell, but each of these little circles are different. So this one's got fish. You see this one's got some flowers, got some birds over here, um, like chest, chest nights, all different kinds of things throughout. Lots of fun details. Um, this incredible gate is by um, Gary Griffin, who was a former master metalsmith, and this is called the Belt Gate. So it's entirely forged from steel. This piece here is meant to look like a belt, um, but of course it's made of steel. And these other two pieces are Yellen pieces. This is a Samuel Yellen grill. And then this is a bank teller window that we acquired. And it is just beautiful. You can see this sort of turn of the century ironwork. I just love it. 
And I'm going to take you shortly into our new acquisitions gallery. So when we acquire something new for the collection, it goes in here on display for just a little while um, before we put it away. I'll just show you a few pieces. This is Jim Masterson. Jim is our um, shop foreman, so he lives here at the museum, and we have acquired this piece by him for the collection. It is a wine chilling bucket, and the top is just gorgeous, and it opens up in sort of a flower pattern. Um, and then these two pieces in the center are two other Brent Canton pieces. So remember the kinetic piece that I showed you first outside. Um, this is from his Icarus series. And both of these pieces balance on a single point. This one here, this one here, and they do rotate. Although I'm not gonna do it now because I don't have gloves on. Um, coming through here, let's go through here. You can see our incredible visible storage gallery and the collections, the curatorial department just loves these because what it means is that we can put more of our collection out for people to view while still keeping them in micro environments. So we have to rotate objects less often. Um, you're probably aware, you know, exposure to light and oxygen can lead to damage over time. So these keep the objects safe um, without them being in a dark room where no one can see them. I just wanna point out these two, <laughs> these two little guys here. Can you guys see those? Um, they're two of Brent Kington's silver toys, um, silver cast toys, which he started making for his children and then everybody wanted one. So there's the top part of the cabinets and then you can open up the drawers and there's stuff inside. This is work by Dorothy Sturm. She's a pretty famous Memphis enamelist. Um, look her up if you don't know anything by Dorothy Sturm. She's incredible. Over here we have our historic lock boxes and coffers. Some of these are as old as the 16th century. Um, and inside, various different padlocks. I love this one that looks like a little dog. These are all historic. Um, let's see, we've got, oh, I love this one, this, this fish lock here, the large fish bar lock. This is a um, letter lock, so like a letter combination lock from 1800. We've got handcuffs from a very long time ago. Those do not look comfortable to me. And um, little keys included with some of them, which is great. Uh, more giant locks. I think they just sort of get bigger as we go down. Let's look at this last drawer. Oh yeah, these are the big guys here. And then I think this one over here contains most of our knives. Oh yeah, there we go. So we have a great knife collection. Um, artists from all over got Ron Lake over here. He's a very well-known bladesmith. Um, <laughs> the same thing over here. These get bigger as you go down. Um, some of these are very intricate. Robert Coogan is another very famous um, bladesmith. This is Phil Baldwin. Phil Baldwin was our first master metalsmith back in 1983. That one's called Night Fighter. So yeah, lots of knives over here in this one. We'll move over to this one over here. I think this has got some jewelry in it. Ooh, yeah. So we've got some of our beautiful earrings and brooches in this one. Um, Susie Gantch, our football series. This is Lisa Gralnick. Uh, Richard Kimball, these gorgeous pieces up here. All of these folks were former masters. Um, Heather Bayliss, who's a young artist I just am obsessed with. Look her up if you get a chance. More jewelry in here. 
Um, obviously, art jewelry is an enormous part of metalsmithing, contemporary metalsmithing. This is, um, I'm gonna point this one out, J. Fred Wool, who is sort of famous for using recycled materials, so upcycling. This is made from like a soup canton, uh, found objects, lots of cool stuff. All right, that's our visible storage gallery. Um, when you get a chance to come, please come look at these and take in all there is to see. We put our best objects in here for sure. So next thing we're going to do is head out to the shops. And I don't know that they're working on anything today, but regardless, we'll, we'll get to say hello. So really quickly, the shops are working shops. We um, take in commission work. We um, do lots of public projects for schools and things like that. We do uh, awards for nonprofits, um, rails, anything you can think of. And then of course, we also take in repairs. So many of you will have heard of repair days. That is our annual fundraiser. It usually takes place the third weekend in October. Um, obviously, that's up in the air as of right now for us. But it's a time when volunteers will come. They will offer their services and repair objects for the public. And it's a way for us to bring in a good amount of money. But we repair objects year round, as I said. So we have a repair and restoration lab. Anything metal that you need repaired, we can do it. So um, one of the most common ones we see is silverware that's gone through the disposal. We can fix that for you. Um, lawn chairs, metal lawn chairs that are falling apart, we can uh, get those fixed up, powder coated, all that good stuff. We had someone bring by a boat one time during repair days. He called ahead, luckily, but he had a broken railing and we fixed it for him. So here we are at our shearing plow smithy. And during open hours, the public is entirely welcome to come inside. And as you'll see, we have this sort of counter set up that separates the public from the actual shop. Um, and there are several things we did to sort of make this space accessible for the public. So we've added here at the bottom these panels that sort of talk about the basic aspects of forging, what it means. This one is um, essentially about uh, the colors that change as you heat up steel. And now forging is what takes place in the smithy. That is simply the heating up of metal stock and bending and shaping it on an anvil. And I think we have one, two, three, four, four or five different forges in the smithy, several anvils, lots of tools. These are some smithy tool examples we have on display. Um, and then it goes through to the definition of all of those. And then different machinery. One of the most important ones is this one here, our power hammer. Um, obviously hammering on an anvil all day can get tiring. So sometimes with bigger projects, we let a machine do it for us. And then up at the top, these panels go through the history of blacksmithing. So most people probably don't know, we didn't get iron out of the earth until about 1500 BC, which is pretty late. Most people before that were using bronze, um, but then iron took over. And then Henry Bessemer was able to perfect um, the mass production of steel. So that's when we went from wrought iron to steel. And that's what most blacksmiths are gonna to use today. And that leads us all the way up to the 20th century. And of course we had to end with Wally and with us. Um, the other great thing we have on display, uh, we have um, videos that you can watch of different processes. So you come to the smithy, you can press a button, and a video will start. It tells you all about um, a certain working process. So that is our smithy space. And as I said, it's a working space. Um, at any time, we've got the shop foreman, as well as our two blacksmithing apprentices, all of whom live on the grounds. They complete 
uh, commissioned work, but the main purpose of the shop is educational. So we teach the public, we put on demos for tours, um, and we teach classes. So that is probably most folks' favorite aspect is to be able to come down here, learn a skill they might not learn anywhere else. And we encourage you to do that. I move over to our foundry. So the two buildings are actually connected by a breezeway. Um, you see our beautiful wisteria. This is the foundry porch. Um, you'll see once we get inside, it's, it's quite a small space. And so we've put the history panels here on the outside. So in contrast to forging, the foundry is where casting takes place. And casting is the melting of metal until it reaches a liquid state. And then you're pouring it into a pre-made mold to create different patterns. It's almost like a metal copy machine. Um, and that, those panels go through the history. And again, we have the same TV out here where you can do different processes. I'm gonna take you inside. So you can see we have just lots of little things everywhere. This little gnome is my favorite. This is the Lawler Foundry. So it's a smaller space in the city for sure, but we still um, have tour groups come in. This is the poor floor back here. Yes, we do use 3D printing, absolutely. We just got a um, studio space installed inside in the library building where they can create 3D printed patterns. In fact, that's what these are right here. These are all 3D printed anvils. This is our little signature magnet that we sell in the store. So this is the pattern for the mold. So as you can see, they can do five at once. What they would do is pack this with green sand, um, make the impression of it, and then pour with, usually we do these in aluminum. Um, and then they'll put a magnet on the back and we sell it in the store. This right here is probably the most expensive and important foundry tool. This is called a crucible. Um, it's a graphite and clay cylinder that, this is what you use to actually put the metal in and melt it. That's that little furnace back there is what we use during tours. I'll show you a great big one here in a minute. Um, but yeah, this is where the metal is poured from. We use a pouring shank. They go into different molds. And let me see, got any examples around here. This is when they just did. This is actually, um, one of Cassie, who is our, she's our foundry apprentice. This is one of her personal projects. So this is just the, the different kinds of things you can create with casting are pretty incredible. Um, we've done so many different awards in the foundry. Um, we have cast a long time ago, we cast the lion's paw, the zoo. I think that lion is long gone now. Um, but this is this is our metal copy machine room right here. Um, we pour mostly bronze and aluminum here in our foundry, but we also pour iron. So I'm going to show you where we do that. An iron pour is much different than an aluminum or bronze pour because iron has to get so much hotter. So I'm going to bring you back over to this chart over here because it shows the melting temperatures of different metals. So pewter, for example, melts at 350. That's stovetop. You can do that on the stovetop at home. Um, the highest are iron, and that has to get up to almost 3,000 degrees. So pewter the lowest, iron the highest. And an iron pour usually takes upwards of 20 people to complete. And we do these every so often. It's a big event. If you ever get a chance to come down and see, there's lots of big flames in the air, lots of folks running around in full protective equipment, and it's a spectacle. Um, this is our cupola. Her name is Priscilla. And this is where we melt iron. So we, um, we use recycled cast iron. 
usually from things like old radiators. They break them up with a sledgehammer that goes in the top. They layer it with coke, which is a sort of refined form of coal. And then it comes spilling out the bottom there and they catch it. Um, and then usually we've got, this is sort of the line where they would have the molds lined up, ready to pour. So if you ever get a chance to come see it, please do. It's just a great sight. And I'll show you over here, um, one of our favorite cast objects, and it's a very common cast object, a bell. This one right here was in 1853 um, and it was poured by the Buckeye Bell Foundry in Ohio but it was for a ship so ships back in the day all had big cast iron bells like this because of course they needed to warn people to get other way and, and the like um, this one weighs over a thousand pounds I have tried to push it before it's not easy um, some people do manage it uh, and then the framework uh, was done by Keeler Iron Foundry of Birmingham uh, back in the 80s. So this bell came to us actually from a plantation. Um, and the plantation owners actually don't really know how it got there. They discovered it in the 30s. Um, and it's just a little bit of a mystery of how it got to the plantation in the first place. But yeah, beautiful piece. And then the last sort of big sculpture I want to show you, I think lots of folks' favorites, is our beautiful fountain. So, as you can see, let's see, can you get a good look at that? There we go. So, this is um, nicknamed Dr. Iron. Uh, the sculpture itself is called Ideas. And it was made or designed rather by a blacksmith named Doug Hendrickson. And Doug um, designed this shortly before his death in 2007. He died from complications of ALS, which I'm sure you're, most of you are familiar with. It's a, it's a disease that affects the brain and spinal cord and, and um, prohibits movement. And so, of course, the very last thing that remains are his ideas, his head, his brain, which was still working fine. So that's represented by this sort of cast bronze head at the top of this monolith here. And of course the bottom has um, this sort of cast framework with stones. There's a little cast alligator over there. And I think there's a turtle around there somewhere too. And then the plaque over here on the other side, I'll show you, um, has a nickname, his nickname, Dr. Iron and a little cast portrait of Doug right there. So there's a lot of um, nostalgia around this piece for people. And when it's turned on, it's gorgeous. The water streams out from under the head. And then there's a separate nozzle you can turn on where smoke or mist will come out of the top of his head. And we're almost there, heading to our gazebo. So this gazebo was built by the organization I mentioned at the beginning, NOMA, and was donated to the museum. And this is our gorgeous river view. Scan around here so everybody can see everything. So that is the old bridge. Um, if you're ever coming across that bridge, you will be able to see parts of the museum. The library, especially the white building back there, is very bright, especially at night because we have spotlights on it. Um, so look for us if you ever come over the bridge to, to Memphis from Arkansas. This to me sort of um, points to why this area has so much history. You just have to look out here and see, because if you look on a map, what you'll notice is the Mississippi makes a great big right turn right here. 
So putting a fort here made sense, right? Because you can see what's coming that way from miles away. And then you also have the benefit of the cross river view so you can see what's happening on the other side. Um, we've got a barge coming through, great big barge. But yeah, usually when I do tours with kids, um, I point out to them that this is the state line of Tennessee here. That's the Mississippi River marker. Uh, and what you see across the river is West Memphis, Arkansas. And if I were with a bunch of kids right now, we'd all yell, hey, Arkansas. So yeah, this is, this is the main reason why this area has such historic importance. It's also the highest um, elevation for about 200 miles in either direction. And now we're not up very high, but that just points to um, how flat this, this delta area is. But definitely of strategic importance because of the geography. And of course we do lots of events and weddings here at the museum. Um, people love to come down and get this river view. And we hope to be open again for you all soon so you can at least see the grounds and at least come down here and take in this gorgeous view. All right, I think that's all I have and I'm ready to take questions whenever you want. Great, thank you so much, Nancy. It's clear that you love your job and I think that's so great because you, me and Meredith were uh, texting back and forth and just said that you are one of the best museum guides we've ever had. That was just- Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So um, what does museum membership entail? Great question. So you can join at several different levels. Um, if you are a student, if you are a senior, if you want to join as a family, you can do a dual membership. All of those um, different levels are going to be available on our website. And basically you get free admission. You're going to get lots of different mailings, you know, first about what we've got going on at the museum. You'll usually get free admission to any event that we have um, and you get 10% off any purchases in the store, which is lots of fun. And then if you join at the higher levels, you also get discounts on classes and things like that. So we like to think of our members definitely as part of the family. So I think that you'll feel that sense of community for sure if you decide to become a member of the Metal Museum. That's great. And Jacqueline wants to know if um, she comes to the museum, can she push that bell? Yes, yeah. <laughs> if you can manage it. Um, when I've seen it done, it takes two people, so. Very cool. And um, who are some local metalsmiths we should be on the lookout for? Oh, wow. Um, local metalsmiths. Well, I have to plug some of our artists here at the museum. So um, Kevin Burge is our repair and restoration specialist. And he makes gorgeous enameled vessels. You should definitely um, look him up on Instagram. Uh, and then of course, I mean, all of our artists are incredible. Um, Eli Gold, I don't know if you all are familiar with him. He did the, the large uh, uh, cycle sculpture that's near Crosstown. Um, he's fantastic and he comes to lots of our events and um, makes use of our facilities, which we're more than happy to have him do. Uh, Wendy Young is another great local young artist. She works at um, Luger Foundry. Um, other than that, I mean, because we are this national center, I, I mean, we really show people from across America. I mean, and it's definitely not um, Memphis centered, although we love our Memphis artists. So uh, go, if you go on our website and check on the, um, the tributaries list, you're gonna find lots of young artists to follow on Instagram, to, um, to see how their work evolves and see where you can buy it. And speaking of your website, lastly, where can people go to learn more about the Metal Museum and support your efforts? Go to metalmuseum.org. Um, you can buy stuff from the store there. You can look at the exhibits. You can look at our collection online. Um, you can check out all our events there. And of course we are on Facebook and all social media. Um, just look, at, look up the Metal Museum. 
and you will get information about all of our goings on. Um, definitely stay tuned to see when we're going to announce our reopening dates. Uh, we will likely open the grounds first for people to explore and then the buildings a little bit later. So keep an eye out for that. Nancy, thank you so much. We are just um, so delighted to have you today and just to see the grounds and the museum and all of the fascinating work that's being done. I mean, who knew that George Costanza and Bangers and Mash would be part of the tour today? I think that's great. <laughs> we have it all. We have it all. <laughs>